What's it like to go into someone's house, meet with the people who live there and tell them about the past of that house and who lived there before them? Well, we're delighted to have with us today, David Olashuga, uh, award-winning historian, commentator, presenter, whose new series, A House Through Time, started last night on BBC Two. David's books include Black and British, A Forgotten History. He was a co-presenter of the brilliant series, Civilizations, and now we have A House Through Time. Thank you very much, David, for appearing in Festival of Ideas online. My name's Andrew Kelly from Bristol Festival of Ideas. David, what is it like to go into someone's house and, and reveal this history to them? You've done three series now. Well, by the time we've got to the point of filming, we've asked a lot of people if they're interested. We've looked at a lot of houses and someone has decided to be incredibly brave and to open up their house's history to us. Now, they don't know what we're going to find. And at the beginning, we don't know what we're going to find. So it's an incredibly brave thing to do. Uh, it's quite adventurous thing to do. And the, the, um, the people who've done it in the three series, I sort of really admire them because I'm not sure whether, whether I would. Because if you think about the history of most houses before hospitals, it's where people were born, but it's also where they died. You think about the history of crime, you don't know what sort of crimes might have happened in your house. In the last series in Newcastle, there's a very strong chance we discovered that the basement of the house was used as an IRA arms <laughs> dump. So, you know, you have to be really up for it. You have to be really game for this idea of letting all of these researchers and historians into your house to, to discover their history. So in some ways, it's more the psychology of the people who are willing to do this, I think is more interesting than the sort of journey that I go on to. But I just feel like, you know, it's a treat as an historian to be given this, this blank canvas is really exciting. So we're going to talk about the house you chose in, in Bristol, 10 Guinea Street, in a moment. But, but just tell us about the process you, you went through to choose that house. How many, for example, did you shortlist? Well, in this case, um, we knew it was going to be Bristol. We really wanted it to be Bristol. So we were able to ask the city. So with the local press, the Evening Post, um, Bristol 24-7, lots of sort of local, local organisations put the call out. So we got loads of people saying, well, my house is fascinating. There's a backstory um, to my house. We had um, people debating where the house should be. Should it be in Clifton? Should it be in the, in the you know, down on the city near, near the historic city? So it was a kind of, it was great for me, someone who lives in Bristol, that it was such a sort of topic of discussion debate, even before we'd filmed a second of film. So the process was kind of different in Bristol than it had been previously, but the process is really hard because we have to find a house that has a remarkable history, a house that has current residents who are, as I said, willing to take a chance on what we might discover. And we also have to find a house that doesn't just have an interesting 50 years in the 19th century or the 20th century, but has an interesting history throughout. Now you could have a program where the house was amazing for episodes one and two and a bit boring in three or four. And we, we kind of can't do that. So we have lots of great houses that have amazing chapters, but their overall story isn't good enough. So what we look for is turnover, lots of people coming and going. It's good to have a house in an area that starts maybe as a posh area, then goes downhill a bit and then rises again. Areas that have lots of immigration, so we get stories from all over the world. The one thing that really ruins it for us is happy people who live long lives and don't move house. They, they spoil it for everyone because happy lives and sedentary lives where people don't move, where there's no adventures, no coming and going. It's nice, but it's not very interesting. And, and the house you chose, 10 Guinea Street, tell us a little bit about that house and, 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 and the street, it's, it's name, you know, Guinea Street. What, what does that mean? Well, it's a house um, I knew of before we ever thought about making this series because when I moved to Bristol and because I'm an historian, because I'm interested in the Atlantic slave trade, um, I noticed the word Guinea Street on a house near the docks in a city from which 2000 slaving expeditions left and put two and two together. And there's only really, you know, those three houses, number 10, 11 and 12, um, from the 18th century there. We can't work out, even having made the series, whether it was all one house or whether it, when it was divided up and how many houses it was at any one point. It's a really complicated history. But the house was, you know, it's 
it's, it's well documented. It's in the, the Historic England's Guide to Bristol. It's even from the outside with those really interesting um, ornaments, those, those um, decorations carved into the, uh, in, into the stonework. It's obviously a house with a story. So I wasn't that surprised that when we weighed up our options, 10 Guinea Street was the best of our options. And um, we were promised in the first series stories of piracy and abandoned baby and so on. And that, that was delivered extensively. I mean, what, what were the great stories which come out of this house for you? Well, this is an area down by the docks that was in the early 18th century when the house was built, a prime place to live. But of course, in the 1830s and 1840s, Clifton is built and the idea of the suburb really takes off and rich people buy land on the outskirts of Bristol and build grand homes. So Guinea Street's kind of left behind. So what you have, which is always perfect in a house of the time, is you have an area that declines somewhat. And so what we get is we get people living in the house who the original owner never imagined would cross the threshold unless they were going to come and work as a servant. So what I always think is what wouldn't work for this series is, is if we chose a house in a posh area that had always remained a posh area and only rich people had ever lived there, because then it would be the history of rich people. And, you know, that's what Downton Abbey does. We don't need really, in my view, more programmes about just rich people. The great thing about this house and the other houses we've done is kind of all of life is here. Rich people to begin with, and then people in very, very difficult circumstances. And then because this is Bristol and because we go right to the 20th century, we also get the story, I think, of the defining event in Bristol's recent history, which is the Second World War. And we have the story of the Blitz, which impacts directly on Guinea Street and, of course, just transforms the, the face of Bristol and, in some ways, is the key story to explaining why the city we live in looks the way it does today. Now, one of the, the great things about this series is, is the story you take the current owners through and the reactions of them finding out about different aspects of their house, which is a great surprise to them. I mean, what stands out for you from, from this, this particular series? Well, one of the residents of the house is John Haberfield, who in the uh, early 19th century is the mayor of Bristol into the midst of the middle of the 19th century as well. And he is a figure who has to deal with the Chartist rising. He's a figure who'd been involved as a young lawyer in the 1831 Queen Square riot. And what I rather liked about that story is the current residents this being Bristol, this being quite a radical city, they were kind of on the sides of the Chartists and they sort of weren't, they weren't upset, but they weren't kind of over the moon with the idea that this, uh, this figure who'd been trying to put down this working class movement had been um, uh, a resident of the house. I think, I'm pretty sure they didn't see him as a hero. And if they'd been around in Bristol in the 1840s, they would be on the side of the Chartists. So um, it was quite interesting to see their reaction. This is, as I said, Bristol, this is a city with a radical, history. Um, I was really pleased um, that the city, the, the long history of civil disobedience and riots um, is part of this story. Um, Bristol is an extremely fractious city. Um, you know, it's what, it's nine years since our last riot, which was, you know, over um, Stokes Croft, partly over a Tesco metro. I think in most cities, Tesco can open a convenience store and not worry about civil disobedience, but not in Bristol. Mm -hmm. So that sort of radical history of Bristol, which is something that really attracts me to the city and makes me kind of really kind of proud to live here. It's great that that story is told and it's great that the residents of the house today were sort of on the side of the, the radicals rather than the reactionaries. Well, one of the, obviously you've, 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 you've mentioned it already, you can't get away from the slave trade in Bristol and this house was, was implicitly involved in, in, or the owner at one point, is that that's true? It's built by a man involved in the slave trade. The first resident is uh, involved in the Atlantic slave trade. But the reality is, is that that part of Bristol down by the docks on Guinea Street at that point, that all sorts of people were involved in the slave trade, not just people out on missions on slave ships, people producing the goods that were bartered on the coast of West Africa, people who were processing the sugar and the tobacco that were coming back. It's stamped all over the names of buildings and streets in our city. 
And I think in some ways what makes it controversial is not just the events, but that for such a long time, people pretended it didn't happen. And that's by no means just Bristol. I went to university in Liverpool and Liverpool had a similar history of pretending that slavery had happened over there and had not been a feature of the city's past, a central feature. Bristol's no different, London's no different, Glasgow's no different in having a difficulty coming to terms with this history. I think that's changing. I think it's changing in all sorts of positive ways. And I think, I hope what we've done in this city is we've treated the Atlantic slave trade like another chapter in Bristol's history. We haven't tried to brush it under the carpet the way it has done, it has been for many, many decades. But I don't think we've obsessed about it. It is the reason why that house is there. It's the reason that street is called Guinea Street. It is a chapter in Bristol's history, but it's one of many chapters. So it's prominent, but it doesn't dominate. Now, there's a book out currently that just published um, last week, um, A House Through Time. This is a book which covers why housing is important to people, different types of housing, different types of how cities are made up, suburbs and so on, and, and why we're fascinated, as well as some tips on, on how to research. I mean, one of the things which struck me reading that is is you can't divorce the house from the city it's in um and that house has gone through as you, you said earlier a whole series of changes which um have also told the wider story of a city you know from um you know from its original creation the the area around the docks the way that people moved out of bristol to different suburbs of bristol the way the house went into decline gentrification and so on um, the city is really important to you isn't it well, I, I did a degree in urban history, and I've always been fascinated in how you can look at a city the way you can do as a, at a natural landscape, and you can see the forces that shaped it. The same as a geologist or geographer could look at uh, oxbow lakes and glacial fields, and they can see how the landscape was shaped. Was shaped. We can do the same with cities. So I tend to see houses as the sort of cells within this bigger organism that is the city. And what I love about A House Through Time is that they, these, these are biographies of cities. This is um, four hours on primetime BBC Two. It's about the history of Bristol. We've just arrived in this history through a single house. And that sort of, that very, very precise aperture through which to look through the history of Bristol, it seems very narrow, but it broadens out. You can't explain why we have people living in that house when it becomes a, a subdivided into tenements without explaining the rise of Clifton. The reason the people who are living in that house are relatively poor by the end of the 19th century is because rich people live somewhere else. You have to tell the history of a city in order to explain the forces that shaped any individual house within the city. And you know, we are one of the most urbanized countries in the world. Most of us live in cities. Um, I think it's kind of natural that um, once you start thinking about cities as these sort of these almost organic machines that um, it kind of becomes addictive. I'm fascinated um, by, by the way cities evolve and develop and when I first moved to Bristol you know I kind of wanted to understand why Bristol looked, looked the way it does. One of the things that um, reading the book and then and watching the series, all the series, is how issues that affect us today in cities have been there throughout. These are not new issues we're dealing with. And 10 Guinea Street is, is an example of that, as are other houses. You looked at, you know, throughout we've had histories of inequality, precarious labour, um, high rental costs, um, um, the, um, the growth of social housing, council housing effects of uh, pollution, gated communities and so on, things that we think uh, affect us now in cities have been there for a long time. I mean, and I take the issue of gentrification because you talked about in the book um, the, the way gentrification actually saved the houses that you, you looked at. But of course, gentrification has a much more negative impact as well on places. So I, ironically, the houses you looked at were saved, but, but had an impact on the wider city. Well, I'm always aware that there's a risk when we make these programs, because in all three cases, the houses that we're talking about fell into disrepair. Um, I mean, it's slightly surprising that 10 Guinea Street survived because the rest of the city was demolished. The council were debating what to do with it even before VE Day. So even before the war's over, you know, the, the, uh, 
the, the shadow of the wrecking ball is hanging over Guinea Street. So they are, they are relics, they are survivors. And usually the reason they've survived is not just because um, they were spared demolition, it's because individuals bought them, cared for them, threw their kind of heart and soul into them and saved them. And that's a great story. And, you know, what is the great force for heritage in this city? It's homeowners. You know, what's the great force in this country? Who are the people keeping the built environment alive, keeping it, caring about it, um, maintaining it? It's much more homeowners than anybody else. But there is a problem. There is an issue. You can't just celebrate this without realizing that that process of gentrification, when an area stops being a, an inner city district and starts becoming a heritage quarter, that there are there are losers as well. There are losers as well as winners. When I was a student in Liverpool, which was quite near um, to the house we had in the first series of a house through time, my mates used to live in those those big houses because. They were run down. No one wanted to live in there. Um, you could sort of get 10 kids living in a house. It was fantastic. Friends from London would come and ask us, how come you guys live in these enormous mansions? When I went back to make the series, there's not a single one of those houses shared by students because they're all been done up and converted and they're modernized and they are, they're beautiful. But, you know, the community that used to live there doesn't live there anymore. So while I celebrate this incredible new passion that we have in this country, which is only kind of 50 years old, back in the 60s, people were with eagerness demolishing Victorian and, uh, and Georgian houses of incredible beauty. You know, we saved them, we changed our attitude towards them, we saw their value, but there have been losers in that process as well. And, you know, you've participated in, in a lot of our work, including the Festival of the Future City we run every two years. What are the kind of key lessons come out for you from all of this work you've done, looking at individual houses and your thoughts about cities, about where cities move in the future? Now, I say this in the particular context we're, we're in now, where we're conducting this because we're both locked down in our houses um, with, with COVID-19. Um, we There's various articles appearing now about this will mean the death of the city. People won't want to be in cities and they'll want to socially distance themselves enormously but one of the lessons coming through from from all your work the book and the, and the tv series is how cities survive through a lot of these problems and not just pandemics but world wars and so on i mean the city will survive i'm, I'm really sure about that but but what do we need to do to make sure it survives in a, in a fairer and better way do you think well, I think you're absolutely right about the resilience of cities. The, the death of cities has been constantly trumpeted and, and never happened. After the Great Fire of London, there was many people who thought London was over, who thought that this kind of blackened ruin was, uh, was never going to, to be revived. And it, within, within a decade, London was booming again. There were even people who left London and moved to places like York, convinced it was dead. Um, after the Second World War, London's population declined and declined. London only got its, took back to its 1939 population in 2015. So it took 70 years for that city to recover. And cities are incredibly resilient. The idea of the city is incredibly resilient. We have had epidemic and endemic diseases that have made the city seem unviable before. Cholera, hit this city in the 19th century, hit it particularly hard in the, in the 1850s. At that time, people were thinking that, you know, we can't live this close together. We can't pack ourselves together like this anymore. And ways were found. The sanitation revolution was found. Ways were found to adapt the city. And that's what will happen. it will be interesting to look at how we treat our houses now, because I think one thing I would question is whether this is the beginning of not the end, but a decline in the idea of the office. And the office is a relatively modern idea. It's companies like the East India Company who really sort of push forward the idea of everyone coming into a, a big building and working there together. Um, the idea that your home and your place of work was separated is a sort of 18th century modern idea of the separation of those two spheres of your life. But I think we're now, and even before this crisis, getting back to the idea that your home and thanks to technology, your place of work can, can merge. I think that's going to accelerate enormously. I think if someone was making a history of houses in 50 years time or 100 years time, and they looked at this period, what they would see is a huge spate of conversions of houses to build offices, 
to build places of work. I think there will see an increase in people wanting to live on the edges of cities and um, suburbs, people wanting more space, people worrying less about commutable distance because might, they might go into an office you know, twice a week rather than five days a week. I think this is going to have a profound effect, partly because we're living through a trauma, but also because this, the technology, its potential has been revealed to us. So technology can exist. It can already be there, invented, tangible, available, and not quite have caught on. And I think if anything good can come out of this crisis, the idea that the, the technology can, you know, release people from the daily commute, that it can give us more options about where we live and how we live, how we shape our houses. I think those, there's some positives to be had, had there. However, if you were going to say what defines this crisis, inequality. The people who are affected most badly are people who have no financial choice other than to be packed onto public transport, other than to return to work. I think all crises, cholera in the 19th century, the COVID crisis today, what they show is that diseases might be indiscriminate, but societies aren't. And this is a deeply um, divisive and discriminating uh, crisis. The final point I want to ask you about in, in terms of, of the book is you devote quite a, a bit of um, time to, to the growth of council housing. And one of the programmes that, that we worked on with you and with others last year was on the centenary of the council estate. So I was I was delighted not only to see this, but also the, 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 the mention of, of sea mills and the importance of that in, in the history of, of council housing. We do need, don't we, a major new programme of, of council house building in this country? I think any long view at the history of housing in Britain would say that the decision in the 1980s to prevent councils from building social housing, to prevent them taking the receipts from the sale of council houses and right to buy to build more council houses was one of the biggest social mistakes, policy mistakes of the 20th century. And I think we're now living with the effects of that. When I first heard the word housing crisis it wasn't in the 90s when it was in the news it was it was kind of when i was beginning to study the 19th century when i was when i was a, a kid and we've had a series a rolling series of housing crisis the sanitary crisis of the 1830s 1840s was a housing crisis our current crisis is a crisis and that is the right word this is the most fundamental denial of the most basic of needs shelter space the capacity to have a family, and it is being denied to millions of people. I think this crisis, to go back to you know this moment of history that we're in, I think that has to at least give us an opportunity to reassess this. We've not been able to walk through British cities for a long time without seeing a rise in homelessness, people literally sleeping on the streets. That problem was addressed within weeks of this crisis. We suddenly found there was a way of doing it in an emergency. We surely, surely can't go back to street homelessness on the scale that we've had it for the past couple of decades after this crisis. And surely in the need to rebuild the economy, in the need to find new ways of making our cities work in the attitudes that will be changed by this crisis, there is an amazing opportunity to invest in social housing and to see housing as, an, as a need, not as just a commercial product. The final area I just wanted to briefly discuss with you is uh, a lot of this work relies on, on the hugely valuable work that archives uh, hold and that the, the archivists provide. Your book and, and the, 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 the series makes that clear. Um, we're in huge debt, aren't we, to those who, who help record and preserve the past like this? I mean, I always say when people talk about um, about the history of their houses um, that every city has got this this kind of magical resource that not enough of us go to. And Bristol is incredibly well served. Bristol archives are wonderful. They've played a central role in making this series possible. I've been there many times. I've been there before this series. I used to live in a, a Victorian house in uh, down in Bedminster and you know within months of moving in I went there and they had so much material not just on the house but on the street and the reason why it had come about. That, that resource is under huge pressure and is undervalued and the archivists who do that work, who, who preserve our history, who have really kind of you know allowed programs like this allowed people to 
get active and do research in their own houses. We, it's, they, are, they are kind of heroes of this story. And Bristol is incredibly well served. Not only does it have the archives, we have lots of great local historians. There's lots of people to follow on Twitter and social media um, who are into the history of the house. We have Know Your Place, which won a Historic England Award for as a, as a kind of brilliant online resource, which I would recommend to anybody who got their work. If you really want to remember that the city that we're lucky enough to live in has this incredible past, kind of over a thousand years of kind of rich history from, you know, the castle being destroyed by, by uh, Oliver Cromwell to the uh, long history of riots to the disaster of the Blitz. You know, it's all there, you know, magically preserved in documents and books and photographs and paintings in the archives. Now, now one thing that's going to happen from the series like this is people are going to say, well, I'm going to research my own house now. It's difficult to get to the archives at the moment in physical terms, but any online tips that you can offer people? Well, the first thing I do is go to know your place, because what I always say is that what you want to do when you're researching your house is you want to get addicted to it. You want to want to know more. And I think the thing that makes you want to know more is maps. There's something wonderful about finding your house on a map and then seeing that the city around it is not the city you live in today, but a, a previous city, seeing that there are green fields where there are now houses and offices or going further back in time and seeing the space where your house is going to be, but hasn't yet been built. Maps are kind of addictive. And the great thing about Know Your Place, this kind of unique Bristol resource, is you can flick between different maps from different ages in the city's history, and you can see how your house fits into this kind of this incredible, you know, thousand long, thousand year long human story that, you know, that we call Bristol. And I think that's a great place to start. Um, there's newspapers, lots of newspapers are online there. It's a brilliant place to start. If you're very lucky, you'll find your house mentioned in, a, in court reporting. And the moment you find crime in, a, in any sort of kind of you know, bit of historical research, there's a whole world of resources because court records are some of the best records we have. There's um, insurance documents. There's the, um, the thing called, which is um, called um, Lloyd George's um, Doomsday Book which is a, a, an early 20th century audit of all the houses in the country. Again, that's available online. It's a fantastic resource. And then there's the sort of the, uh, the places that can help you, the, uh, the ancestry and the find my, path, find my past sort of websites that for, you know, for sort of a fee will help you. A lot of people who get into genealogy, who want to find out the story of their family, they also get addicted to the idea of looking into their house. It's often the next project after family research. And some of the same online resources can help you find the history of your house. Well, there's some great tips there, David. Thank you very much for spending time with us in our Festival of Ideas online. Um, if you'd like to pursue this further, the book, A House Through Time by David Olashuga and Melanie Back Hansen is published by Picador. The TV series, A House Through Time, continues to run. And you can also see the previous series, uh, Other House Through Time, on BBC iPlayer. So take a look out for those. Thank you very much. And thank you again, David Olashuga. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks.